Good morning. So we're ready to start for lecture five. Um, we have a lot of things to, to go through, so I'll try to, to start on time uh, every week from now on. Well, uh, as usual, there are some references you can use to complement my lecture slides. And again, uh, this manual comes from Switzerland, so this means that it won't be the same in terms of uh, conventions and in terms of drawing standards, but still uh, you will find so many references and there is also an historical part. Our library has got the electronic resource for that, so you, you can just use the Adobe Digital Editions and uh, read it in PDF, so I, I, I find it very helpful. So just bear this in mind, you'll find a lot of information in this and some of the pictures and information in these lecture slides are actually taken from this book. But what we'll cover today is uh, divided in this way. First we talk about the material, so the basics. So what is concrete, what's the mixed design, so how to mix the, the ingredients of the material. And uh, then what is reinforced concrete? There might be some overlaps with what you did in constructing environments. I apologize for that, but it, in some ways we'll need to cover that a little bit again. Uh, the second thing is about when the mixture is ready to go, then how you place it, what type of form locks you can have, and uh, also what are the main properties you need to care about in order to have a a durable and strong material. Uh, the third part <coughs> focuses on construction methods, but especially on a single one, like just this, this slab on ground, because uh, I guess you're going to find it in most of your case studies. In most of your case studies, you're going to have a slab on ground. Uh, in other cases, you will have a timber deck, so you'll have to wait one week for when we talk about timber next week. But you will see a few photographs of the construction site and I will bring you through that. Concrete architecture is the last part as usual after the break. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about is concrete as in terms of materiality. So when it's used uh, for walls and really you feel the materiality of uh, concrete. Concrete has uh, a lightweight structure. So in terms of shells or hyperbolic paraboloids, these type of things. And concrete also in a more expressive way, in a structural way, and some early projects by Auguste Perret and Le Corbusier. So these are more or less the type of things I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover in the last part. It's mainly uh, a bunch of slides, so I'll just go through some details. I visited most of these buildings myself, so I can show you some images which you won't find in the, in the books, so very close-up details. So that's the main purpose of the second part of the lecture. Well, about material properties, um, we have to start in the period of the Romans. In the Romans, say, what we nowadays call concrete was already used in a, in a more primitive way. It was called opus cementicium. Um, come on, guys, please try to, uh, to be here on time. Um, and what is that? It's curiously, together with steel, the only construction material you cannot find in nature. Even glass can be found in nature, but concrete and steel have to be handmade, have to be manufactured. All right, so there was this concept of mortar, you remember from the last lecture, mortar that you used to bond together uh, masonry units. So what happens here is that concrete is, is, a, is a very similar stuff, but what they realized is that they, they could actually make the, the, the masonry wall stronger just by uh, building two lifts and then filling in the void with this mixture. So that was the way they used to, to use this called opus cementitium. They, they, they were also uh, quite good in realizing lightweight structures. In this case, we see a dome so that we are actually um, uh, using the properties of the of structural form to distribute the forces only in axial stress. What does it mean? It means that we've got a surface and we try to distribute the forces never through bending moment, so never normal to the surface, but always along the surface. 
so that we can reduce the thickness and make sure that we get this very la large span and lightweight structure. The Romans were already used to do so, and uh, there is a masterpiece that is still the biggest unreinforced concrete dome in the world. It's about 43 meters of span, and it's the Pantheon in Rome. You can go there and visit it. Uh, it's open to the public. Uh, and uh, here we see that they were already mastering this kind of technique for a few reasons. So first, in terms of structural form. This is an analytical surface. What does it mean? It means that we take a sphere, so a geometrical element, and we take advantage of that geometry to construct the roof. This has a specific property to distribute the forces in, in a way that is more efficient than a normal beam. Uh, another thing we see that they uh, decided to taper the cross section. You see, uh, the wall is, has got a constant cross section, but then it's tapered until we reach the opening at the apex of the roof. So what happens here is that uh, we have another element. We try to reduce the amount of material used so that it becomes lighter towards the top. The third thing is that probably you won't be able to read it, but the mixture of concrete is always made of water, aggregate, and cement or lime in this case. And what they did, they changed the aggregate to make it always lighter. So the density, you see, decreases from 1,600 kilogram per cubic meter, and it becomes 1,500, and then 1,350. So it's a, a way to make it lighter. So a few things combine together to, to, to define this incredible structure. But then after that, there was a period during the Middle Ages in which uh, the, the knowledge of concrete was actually lost. Uh, it completely disappeared. And uh, we need to wait. Um, this period in which uh, there was this uh, John Smith, this uh, English guy, who decided to use uh, a specific thing called hydraulic lime to, to use it as a mortar for, for lighthouse. So what he discovered is that, that this mixture was able to react uh, when uh, in contact with water. So that was a suitable situation to build a lighthouse and uh, this was, let's say, the beginning of what we call now the ordinary Portland uh, cement. So that was actually cement that is able, compared to mortar, to react under water. And it's called hydraulic because there is the hydration process that makes that happen. But, so cement and concrete now we start understanding what is the main difference between mortar and uh, modern concrete. So modern concrete has a, a main ingredient, which is cement. And uh, uh, there is also aggregates, fine and coarse, and there is water, which is generally w potable water, something you can drink. It has to be clean. It can't be any type of water, salty. That, that, that wouldn't be fine. But what happens is that these are the three main ingredients of, of today's concrete. And it's, it's knowledge that dates back of about 200 years. This is the ordinary one. Here you see a, a picture of uh, the OPC, so Ordinary Portland Cement. So what, what happens is that the Portland name uh, comes from the color of a Portland stone. Uh, but n nothing to do with this, but we still use this name in a broader meaning. And uh, we need to know that this is a very, mm, let's say, labor-intensive industrial uh, product. As I said before, together with steel requires skills, labor, knowledge. It's, it's an engineered uh, material, so you don't find it in nature. It has to go through process of burning limestone slurry and then you combine it with silica, iron and alumina. All right? So what happens? Uh, I think I'm going to show you with another diagram which is clearer. You take limestone and clay 
uh, you crush it so that it becomes a powder. And that is concrete, the base for concrete. So that's the beginning. It's a blend that then you, you actually burn, you cook in, a, in the clink to get this type of stuff here, uh, which is called clinker. With this clinker, again, you crush it again to get another powder, and that's the ordinary concrete. That's a semi mill. Right? So that's the product you can use together with water and aggregates. Uh, fairly simple, but it's highly industrialized. Uh, there are also supplementary materials. That they can be called additives, uh, admixtures. Uh, they are meant to change or improve some properties of the initial material. In some cases, maybe you want to accelerate the setting phase, or you want to retard it, or you want to change concrete color. So for this type of things, you use several different types of blends. Um, you, you're not required to, re to recall all of them, but any time you have a specific need, bear in mind there is always a solution of this kind, which is always preferable to use water. Most of the times you want to have a more workable mixture, you tend to use water. That is not fine because you change the water cement ratio. So admixtures, additives, blends, these type of things are generally what you need to work on if you want to change the properties of the material. And they have to be added in a very small percentage of the mixture. Generally between five to eight, ten percent, no more than that. Unless you're gonna uh, do some damage to the final mixture. In Australia, we've got seven different types of concrete you find on the market. But as far as I know, the first three are generally the, the most diffuse. So you, you will probably deal with the first three in most of the occasions. Uh, well, there can be other cases in which, let's say, you have to pour a very large slab, and this kind of reaction generates heat. So you might want to use a low heat material, <coughs> age. But that's for a specific application. In other cases, maybe you need to go faster, so you need to remove formworks rather, e rather fast in about a day. So what you do, you use a high early strength material so that, that allows you to remove the formwork rather, rather fast compared to the others. But the first three, general purpose, Portland, Blaine, and Limestone, are the most common types. White cement is also available. So in this case, what happens is that uh, you, you, you change, uh, most of the times you change uh, the aggregates to, to get a different color in the concrete. Now in the cement, you can't do that because we're talking about limestone and clay. So there is a chemical uh, composition that is different. I, I'm not asking you to require that there is this high tricalcium aluminate compared to the tetracalcium aluminate ferrite, but uh, just bear in mind, you can get white cement, which is also the, very similar to the product you use for white mortar. Water. So what about water? Uh, water is very important. As I said before, you can't take uh, water from the sea. It, can be, it, it must be clean. It doesn't have to be salty. And the rule is that if you can drink it, it's fine. So generally, potable water is fine, it's accepted. And in some cases, we can also uh, recycle water and filter it. So this is generally the way uh, companies get water for, for that. What is the purpose of water? First is to let the cement react, but also to make the mixture workable in order to take a specific shape. Because concrete itself doesn't have a shape. It takes the shape of a formwork, of a container you give. It's like water, really. The shape depends on uh, what you want it to be. So water makes it more workable to, to, to spread it around. And the process of combining cement with water is called hydration. Uh, what's important to know about hydration is that it's not reversible. So once it's done it, you can't go back. Once you get concrete, you cannot divide again water and cement. 
I know it sounds obvious, but it's, it's important to know that this is a non-reversible uh, <coughs> operation. Another thing that is important to know is about the time frame you need for this chemical reaction to happen. So generally, once you put water and you start mixing the ingredients, uh, everything sets up in about an hour. So in that case, it will become more difficult to work. And in about a day, if you start getting a higher strength, two, three, four days, maybe you're already able to remove the formwork. And then in 28 days, let's say a month, you will have between 95 and 100 percent of the strength, the required strength. So if you want to make a test of how your concrete resists to compressive loads, you have to do that after 28 days of technically called curing. So what about the water cement ratio? Uh, there is this diagram on the right. Uh, have a look at the curve at the top for this normal concrete. So what happens is that Water is important, and this ratio is very important as a matter of mixed design. So what, what we generally do when we put the ingredients together, we, call, we talk about mixed design. So we define the proportions of the ingredients. And water cement uh, acts on three different things. The first is strength. So if there is too much water, we are going to reduce the strength of the final product. Durability which is strictly related to strength. So we're going to make either a stronger or less strong material. And you can imagine it's quite obvious thinking that uh, the more the concrete, the more durable. Uh, workability might be important when you are on site and you want to you know, just place, so once you have poured the material, you want to place it to, to make a slab or a wall, you need a specific workability. All right? So it doesn't have to be hard already. And this workability is generally managed through the water cement ratio. There is a theoretical minimum you can achieve, which is 0 0.42. Below this threshold, the concrete doesn't exist. Of course, it's impossible to reach that level. But in, in a very good mix, we go between 0.45 and 0.5. So they are generally very good ratios. And if we need to make a more workable concrete, what we do, we use another additive rather than adding water so that we don't affect durability and strength. So that's the overall idea. You see immediately here the, what would be the strength when the water cement is 0.5 and what would be when it's 0 0.45. So there is a, like it's almost a linear increase in terms of strength. Aggregates are the last ingredient of concrete. In theory, you can just mix water and cement and it would be fine. It still reacts, but there are two things. The first, we don't want to spend money because cement is a precious material. It's expensive. So we want to save that and we want to use sand instead. Uh, and also we want to make it more durable so we use stones. We use this coarse aggregate. It could be stone, gravel, crushed rock. We make it more durable. We make it stronger. So on the one end, we save cement. On the other end, we make sure that the material is stronger and more durable. And we generally combine coarse and fine aggregates. Again, this is not whatever you find. You're going to you know, dig on your garden and you find whatever, so it's not dirt. This has to be a clean selection of specific aggregates. So what about the, the shape? So when the, when the course gets, you know, an important shape, about 20 mil, 30 mil, so they're small stones actually. Uh, in that case, the shape they have becomes important. And there are two main types. So the first one you see on the left, they're rounded. These rounds are very fine when you need to work the material well, so you can really spread it in a nice way on the slab. And it will go through the reinforcing roads without creating troubles. But if you want to make a stronger mixture, you probably need something that is more angular, 
like the, the samples you see on the right of the picture. Um, I'd invite you to look at this precast concrete handbook, which has got a lot of images about this type of things. So if you really want to, I don't want to bother you with 2,000 images about aggregate rates, this and that, because the best thing is that you define your own mixed design at the very moment you need it. It's not important you know all of that. It's important you know the principles behind it. Aggregates grading. So what about that? Now, the point is that we, we know that generally it's a good idea to mix coarse and fine aggregates, but it's also important to do that in a specific way. So generally, we define a range in size that goes from coarse to, uh, to fine. And there are two main possibilities. So, so there is a gradient, or there are two main families, like large and small, like sand, and this is what happens. Um, uh, look at this mixture. We've got 25% cement and 75 aggregate. And then water is in a ratio with cement, 0 0.5. Look at all these voids. All these voids uh, would save about, I mean, this is just a conjecture, would save about 5% of cement if they were actually filled by sand, so fine aggregates. If you look at the image on the right. But that's why we would like the aggregate to range in size. See that? So let's have a look again at the mixtures. Um, generally, um, you don't need to remember what they are. You need to remember what you would like to achieve. And there are two very important things. You want to accelerate the setting up, so the set, set process. You want to accelerate the hardening, or you want to retard it. So that might be related to, for instance, in this case, you could say cold, humid, or very hot weather. Or in some cases, you are uh, casting very long walls, and you don't want to see uh, a joint. So you pull the first one, and then you place a retarder. And then you pull the second one, and you place an additive that accelerate the process so that they actually uh, set at the same time. So it doesn't have to be necessarily for cold and hot weather. There can be several reasons to do that. But generally, it's to accelerate or retard the process before curing. Um, in other cases, you really want to improve the workability, but you don't want to add more water. So in this case, there is this lag or fly ash. Uh, and pigments. Pigments are rather important for architects because sometimes you want to get, let's say, a kind of reddish color or white cement, and you need to add some specific add additives to, to get that color, which is also affected by the, by the aggregates. Now, the interesting part, it's not concrete in itself, but it's concrete when combined with steel. So reinforced concrete, or RC, you'll find it somewhere around, also just with the label RC. Um, this is a bridge in Sydney, uh, one of the first allies with this technology, which take advantage of a patent by this gentleman, Mounier. So what happened? He was a gardener, and he was sick of getting his uh, clay pots continually cracked and broken. So the idea was that, OK, I'm going to make a steel cage, and then I protect it with concrete. So that was actually really the idea of reinforcing steel, protecting steel. So to substitute the conventional clay pot to put these nice flowers. Doing that, he actually invented or reinvented reinforced concrete. So the idea is behind that. This type of invention went around the world in exhibitions and expositions. And there is another guy, Francois Hennebic, who actually saw that at the Paris International Exposition in 1867. And he decided, he was a builder, not a gardener, and he said, I might want to use this for my projects and, and my own constructions. Um, but there are a few main differences. 
there is a story that says that his original idea was to use concrete, not to create like a unique material coming from steel and concrete. It was mainly uh, meant to protect the steel from corrosion and fire. So that's a story. But somehow, look at this image. He was already aware of what were the properties of the two materials. Uh, concrete can resist to tensional forces. It's a little bit like masonry. Steel is very good at the same time in compression and tensional forces. So it means that, look at this. This is a, this is a slab or a beam, and it's supported here, and it will be supported at the other end. So tensional forces are at the bottom, because generally it would bend this way. So you see that there is knowledge exactly of where the two materials would perform at best. So there is this idea of combining the two materials to get something stronger. And I think that if you look at this, uh, I found this pattern uh, from the United States um, uh, archive a few years later, 1890A. But you see this is a profile of a section of a beam with supports. So you see exactly how the steel follows the diagram of the bending moment. So the bending moment goes up here, and then it becomes down. You have a deflection, and then it goes up again, and then down. So you see the steel really follows that diagram and tends to react to that, whereas concrete uh, takes in account all the compression forces. There are also other bars which complete the cage, and they're mainly used to react to shear. There are a few interesting examples around of this kind, but I decided to show you that one that you might not be aware of. So this is the Turin Lingotto factory, it's the car factory, Fiat. They're not producing Cinquecento there anymore, but they, they used to. And uh, the, the factory is so long that there is a track on the roof to test cars. So the cars are actually tested on the roof when you look on the city. And to reach the roof, you need to go through this ramp. So this ramp is one of the first examples of reinforced concrete in that north part of Italy. And this is the Ennabic principle. So you see clearly the skeleton made of beams, columns, and then the slab on the top. So the skeleton is visible. It's part of the expression of the building. And there was one single company to which uh, the patent was licensed in the north part of Italy, which is Ferrero and Porchedo. So whatever you find between 1910 and 1940 done in reinforced concrete in that part, they were the builders. So you go in their archive and you find all the projects. A first person, actually he didn't invent anything specific, but but he did something rather interesting. So he revolutionized, uh, he made a revolution of uh, how to use reinforced concrete as a structural engineer with a little of architectural taste. So you see that in any big stuff, the, the, the final result is always a skeleton. This is rather different. This is the idea that everything is merged together and there is no skeleton. The columns have this kind of mushroom shape, but they are kind of, the, the fillet looks like they're actually blended together in the slab, and there is a single structure without separation, without hierarchy of uh, beams and then another slab on the top. So this becomes thicker, uh, uh, sorry, thinner, and uh, it could save a lot of space by doing this. So this system, I know it looks very similar maybe for you, but I tell you it's rather different from the structural point of view. He was also one of the pioneers in designing bridges in reinforced concrete. So this is a typical arch bridge. So you see the arch and uh, the deck and the connections that make the truss out of it. So it's rather elegant. And now let's have a look exactly why uh, steel and concrete work well together and what are the issues of uh, combining steel and concrete. They work well together because they have the same coefficient of expansion. So when there is heat, they expand in the same way. When it's cold, they retract, they reduce the size in the same way. But there is a problem. Um, concrete is exposed to air, 
an air, uh, due to air it reacts and there is a process which is called carbonatation so that the, the concrete itself changes properties just because it's exposed to air. This is fine for 10, 15, 20, 50 years. After 50 years, the carbonatation process has reached about uh, 200 mil, 300 mil, and suddenly you get to the steel. When you reach that point, then steel can be corroded. And if there is corrosion, then steel increases in volume. And this increase in volume, what, what, what happens then? It happens that the concrete just cracks. All right, so you don't have the protection, and again, the process starts over and over. So that's, that's the main issue. Bear in mind, it's more, not carbonation, it's carbonatation. It's something that it, uh, generally, they, they were not, a, the uh, designers were not aware of that during the 50s. They actually realized that after 50 years when they saw the first results of that. So at the beginning, you see this spacing between the, the edge of the beam and the first rod, reinforcing rod. So there is this part which is called concrete cover. And this concrete cover used to be very small, the minimum you could, just to let the aggregate to flow through. Now they tend to increase that to three, five centimeters so that the concrete is actually protected for a long amount of time, from 50 to 100 years. Is that all right? So look at this. This is, uh, uh, you see the beam is still fine, but the, the expansion in terms of size of the, of the steel has created this issue. This is another picture of this defect that is at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Well, in this case, again, I'd like to think that this is because of carbonatation, and then this steel uh, expands inside so that you get rid of all the concrete cover and you lose it. Um, but there could be also other reasons. Could be a problem with the mixture, could be an excessing water, could be some weather conditions. So there, there are several reasons for this to happen. And generally on site, there is an informal term which is called concrete cancer, just to, wh whatever defect you find, they generally identify it with this name, concrete cancer. And uh, uh, I, I gave you, I'm gonna give you one source, this guide to concrete repair and protection. Here you find all the different possibilities from cracking to a complete delamination. And you see, you know, causes and uh, also the way to repair it. So I invite you to look at this reference to go through more details. Now let's have a look quickly at the, at the bars, at the reinforcing roads. So they're actually roads and they are shaped in a way like they're traded. So they have these small slots or uh, mini ribs so that the, the, the friction between concrete and bar is increased and they can have a better stronger connection. There are standards about this in Australia and these are some of the uh, some of the standards. So in some cases you get a full trade, in some other cases you get uh, these ribs or slots. It, it depends on, it's a very technical thing and it generally depends on the type of friction you want to get. When you have very long roads, generally you don't really require mar much friction. So it generally for very small applications that, that you need a stronger, stronger track. And what about the what about the shapes? You can find roads, so just a linear element. You can find a square or a rectangular mesh uh, grid, sorry. Or you can find a trench mesh, which is the same thing. Just you have the elements with different uh, diameters and size. So this is just a bit of terminology of what you find on site and on the market. And there are also labels. Again, I don't want you to remember the label, but I want you to know how to read it. So the way to read this is, look at that. So three means that we've got three bars. N means normal ductility. So you see here we have three possibilities, L, N, and E. 
So low, normal, and earthquake. 16 identifies the diameter in millimeters. So 16 mil uh, means 16 mil. What about this one? Three bars, low ductility, 12 mil diameter, TM means trench mesh. Is that clear? Another one. So we've got, as we said before, square, rectangular grids or trench meshes. And the way to identify these things is always the same. So instead of the bar, we say S, which means square, low ductility, 7 millimeter diameter bar, and these two identifies the spacing of the grid. Okay? So at 200 mil spacing. S CTS means centrings. So actually, the, you take the central axis uh, of the bar, and that's it. We've got accessories, uh, what they are. They are very important and most of the time they are present at the exam because it's a very simple question just to warm up. The first of all is the bar chair. So the bar chair is that we know that steel needs to have a specific color, concrete color. So it can be just placed on the ground and then you pour concrete over it. So what happens is that you have a bar chair to lift it and keep it in position. And this could be done in a few different ways. The first one is the plastic chair. This is very good for a uh, concrete on, on ground, uh, slab on ground, so that we won't see what happens underneath. But when the concrete is exposed, so for exposed concrete that we see the surface, maybe there are these block chairs so that they're done of the same material. So they blend together to have a a specific, uh, to, to, to get a, an homogeneous surface. Uh, some of them are also with clips, in the case they need to be used vertically. And then there are a few coupling connectors. So these are when you need to combine together, you know, two different rods in length. So they can be coupling nuts or they can be just any other type of connectors. Just, you don't need to know about it. Just uh, know the image. Now, casting methods and procedures. Uh, this would be um, the most interesting phase, and I'm putting you something I did when I was a student. Uh, this was a, like a mock-up for a concrete couch. So the idea is that you need to work on the mixture to get something that is very workable. You've got fine aggregates. You don't see the aggregates on the surface. You need to work on the casting methods, but also on the formwork if you want to get a specific design. Because concrete can actually take all the shapes you want if you know how to do that. I mean, I know this is not very precise in a, in a few things. These kind of battles are not so clear. But the overall idea is that you can play with the casting methods to get a specific shape to design it. So that's why concrete is one of the most interesting materials on Earth. And in order to <coughs> design this part, we need to be aware of what are the, the, the properties of the material we need to care about, and also what are the three phases uh, from the fresh mixture until the, uh, the, the hardening. So we know that we need to care about workability, cohesiveness. What does it mean? It means that there could be aggregates going everywhere. So we talk about segregation. So the aggregates have to be connected to the mixture. Strength, so the capability to resist to compression forces and durability. We don't want the concrete to last for 20 years. We want it to last for 2,000 years. And the three phases are fresh, plastic, you know, just mixed. So it's still fresh, workable. And then there is a setting phase so that you won't change shape anymore. It will keep that shape. But still, if you walk on it, there will be footprints. That, that just to give you an idea of what happens. That is setting. Uh, yeah, so this image on the, on, on the middle, if you walk on the concrete and you get this, it's on the setting phase, probably about one to two hours after it was poured. Then there is hardening. It's a very important phase in which we need to follow a process called curing to make sure that we don't lose uh, water 
and that we preserve or either increase the amount of strength that that concrete can generate. So workability. In terms of workability, uh, we need to know that, uh, yeah, of course, the amount of cement in the face compared to water can increase that uh, or reduce it, but also the aggregate grading. Uh, can you imagine when you've got three, three, 300 mil, uh, no, like 30 mil stones uh, in the concrete, how workable is that? Of course, the finest, the better. Uh, so these are the two things to, to work with concrete. And this workability depends on the type of uh, casting you need, to, cast you need to, to make. Of course, the slab is much easier to spread and to, to, to find, the, to generate that shape. When you need to work with walls, it's more difficult, so you need a more workable materials. You might have a few rebates, uh, and you really need to, to make it more workable. How to do that? You don't just uh, mix it according to certain proportions and then you say, okay, then it might be fine. Uh, I'll make sure that uh, the, the, the ratios are correct and then you just trust the mix you've done. Never do that. You, need, you are required by law to test the quality of the mixture in two things. So you need to test the workability and you need to test the compressive strength. The workability is tested straight away on site, maybe not every time, but it should be tested every time on site, and we use this cone. So this is a taper cone, 100 mil on the top, 200 on the bottom. So what you do, you fill it in with concrete and then you release it slowly, and then you measure the, the slump. And there are a few possibilities. So it's really reliable when it's between 20 to 120 mil, uh, it's out right outside range when it's zero, so it's not workable, it's hard. When it collapsed, maybe due to segregation, so the aggregates didn't react with cement, so they are not connected. Or when there is shear, so when it's not symmetric. So in that case, the test has to be repeated because it's not reliable. And we know that uh, as a rule of thumb, generally speaking, we have this from 30 to 80 mil, it's mass concrete. 50 to 80 can be used for our unreinforced puttings. You know, it's very easy just to spread it and you don't, don't need a very workable material. And 80 to 120 mil for reinforced walls. So this is a slant test I did myself, and you see that this is about, this is a concrete that was reliable for, uh, probably for walls. Uh, I'm, I can't read it now, but I remember that I used that for that small tile. So you see, that's the type of concrete you get. The aggregates were very fine, so you don't see any coarse aggregate here. Uh, the test is symmetric. And yeah, this is another test. Uh, what is wrong with this? Uh, this is not entirely collapsed, but the main issue is segregation. So you see that the aggregates are not connected with cement and water. They are separated, so they, they segregate. So in this case, the mixture is not correct, and it has to be thrown away and redone. Or you need to add further cement and water and redo the mixture. But this is a problem that can happen, so segregation. When you see aggregates here and there, it, it's not going to last, all right? Because that is not concrete. Looks like, but it's not. So what about strength and durability? Strength and durability, it's something that you can't verify straight away. You need to wait 28 days because there is, you know, the first setting and then up to 28 days of curing and generally you get 95% of the strength. So you just take a sample, it's a cubic sample, standard size. You compress it until you break it. And then you calculate exactly what's the what's the compressive strength of the material. Um, I'm repeating again, the type of cement, there are stronger and weaker cement types. So this is one main factor. So from that, you should expect a specific strength. From your water cement ratio, you, you should also expect a specific strength. But there are a couple of things which are more or less predictable, which is compaction and curing. 
that phase of hardening of 28 days, you don't really know what happens. So in that case, you are playing the game. If it's becoming better than expected or lower than expected. So compaction, what is that? Uh, in the mixture, there is always a, a, a little bit of air, a presence of air, and this could be 5, 10, 15 percent depending on the way you mix it, and you need to get rid of that. And the way to do that is using generally vibrators, immersion vibrators. So you see in this sample, this is one of these cubic samples to measure compressive strength, and you just uh, place this, it's also called needle, vertically for a few seconds, the air goes out, and then you remove it, and we can say that the concrete has been compacted. So that's something that you need to do first by hand, and you also need to do it precisely. So you can't just mix it, you know, like it was, uh, I don't know, uh, the pizza dough, you have to do it properly, always vertically and according to a specific, it's not, this is not cooking, so it's according to a specific pattern. It could be square or an offset pattern. Why you do that? First, because you want to make sure that all the different parts of the concrete have an homogeneous comp uh, compacting phase, but also that there is reinforcement. So the first mistake you could do is that you accidentally eat a rod and you change its position. So that's why you do it vertically. Okay? Uh, what about this? Uh, this is a kind of a screed, automated screed, that is suitable when you have a very thin slab, let's say up to 200 mil in depth. So you can just use these surface vibrators. So you don't need to use the needle. It would take ages. So in that case, another possibility to vibrate slabs, maybe very large slabs. And then we arrive to the important phase called curing. So what happens? Uh, the concrete is hardening, and it's con therefore it's continually losing water. And we don't want to do that, because if it loses water, the, the cement water ratio changes, the strength is going to change consequently, so what we want to do, ideally, we would like to preserve that concrete under water. Humidity, 100%. And there are a few ways to do so. The first is that we place a membrane, a waterproof, an impermeable membrane on the top of the slab, for instance, so that whatever water comes out, sweat out of the, of the concrete slab, it's still there. The other possibility is that we supply water continually for 28 days, constantly, so that we get a perfect result. Uh, when you see, you see that there is this water, this uh, uh, sweat here. It's called, informally, it's called bleeding. But technically, there is another term that you won't hear many times, and it's called exudation. It's like to sweat out. Okay, exudation. The third type, temperature curing, is generally done off-site. So for precast concrete to uh, speed up the process of curing. So it's not of our concern at the moment because you will do this in construction design. Next year you will talk a lot about precast concrete and we don't have many examples in our case studies dealing with precast concrete. Uh, this is a shrinkage. Uh, this is another issue that we need to talk about, and again, it doesn't really depend on your mixture, not necessarily. It might depend on time. So it's becoming an in a problem, especially when we talk about very tall buildings. You know, we've done the, the tallest building in the world is more than 800 meters, and it's actually done in concrete. But a, a shrinkage of about, let's say, 20 to 30 centimeters on that kind of size, it becomes to be, you know, it becomes notable. So it's not something that we can just avoid. Uh, shrinkage is, is a natural property of uh, concrete that continues over the time to do that. 
Uh, and there are also, so it could be ambient conditions, but in some cases there could also be your own mistake because you did, there are maybe poor aggregate quality or maybe the water cement ratio wasn't right, especially in the curing phase. Now, uh, what about the formworks? So, we've always spoken about the mixture and how to place it, but we haven't spoken about the negative part of it, so the container which gives shape to the concrete. Uh, the foremost can be classified in three different families. The traditional ones, which are generally done with timber planks. The engineered ones, which are generally uh, reusable elements several times. They're used for large constructions and uh, there are lost formworks. So something that you just place there, you put the concrete and they become the same thing. Okay, so it's lost because it, it remains inside the stays inside the, the, the mixture. So look at the traditional ones. They're generally done in timber planks or pieces, and uh, they're very labor intensive. So it takes a while to prepare this stuff and to make sure that they're always well tied together. Uh, but for instance, look at this. This is the construction site of the Prima Tower in Melbourne. And when you go in height, they thought that it was much faster to bring small timber pieces than very large and heavy metal sheets. So in this case, when you want to work in height and you don't really want to lift heavy loads, uh, that could be one possibility to do to use traditional formworks. But uh, another way or another case in which you want to use these formworks is when you need to give a bit of curve to the mixture so that uh, you remember that in the second lecture I spoke about ruled surfaces and hyperbolic paraboloids. Well, in this case, this is called uh, the red kilometer, kilometer rosso. It's a, it's a factory in, uh, in the north part of Italy, close to Bergamo. And uh, this is like the, it's like the back part of a, of a Ferrari. So the idea is that there is this curve that should be aerodynamic. And uh, it's all done out of concrete. So these tim timber plants are actually placed to generate a ruled surface, one single ruled surface, and then the concrete is poured and they are removed. So they're very traditional. Timber plants you can recycle a few times. The engineered formworks are uh, kind of similar, but you can stay if you want. wrong class. Um, so the engineered formworks are kind of similar, that just done in a way that they can be reused uh, in a more simple way. So they're generally made of these metal elements which are tied together with these rods. So the point here is that there are generally standard sizes and you can just place them poor and replace them somewhere else easily. So generally it's a matter of size and also standardization. Also try to imagine a core for a skyscraper, a core of a lift, these type of things. They, they, they are very suitable for this kind of operations. So I can show you that also for the slabs, this is a, um, again the Prima Tower, but the formworks of the slabs are engineered. So you see that these elements are all standard. Another detail and uh, these are samples from uh, one of the most important companies that does this is Perry. They have resellers all around the world and uh, the headquarters are in Italy and these are samples displayed there. So what I want to show here is that you see they've got these metal studs which can they actually make a frame and that they readapt it so always the same standard elements to, to be reused in several different configurations. And what they actually care about in this model, they want to show how to make the angle. Because most of the times when you have an angle and you have two elements and you connect them in L shape, you're going to see two lines on one wall and one line on the other, which is not what you want. So they, they, they are studying different ways to make a nice, clean corner with this type of formworks. So that's generally what they wanted to show with that. In this case, you see at the back, look at the surface. It's already uh, with a specific pattern so that when we remove the formwork, 
And that's the type of finish of the surface. The last case of loss formwork is the bond deck, for instance. So we have this uh, steel profile sheathing that is actually the, the, the formwork. And when the concrete is poured, they become the same thing, and that's the slab. So that's the final product. Um, and another case could be when you've got insulation under uh, here under the, the barches of a, of a uh, slab on ground, so that you place the insulation above the membrane, then you pour concrete, and the insulation remains inside. So again, it, it, it's lost. So that's a kind of formwork. At the same time, it gives shape, it performs, and, and then it's lost. So quickly, two minutes, and then we'll have a break of 10 minutes. Uh, slab on ground. I'm sure this is in uh, a few of your case studies. So what happens? There are, you know, if you look at this guide to residential floors, you will find several different types. But what I'm talking about here is the stiffened raft. So what generally happens is that there is this, I'll show you in, in more detail. So there is a slab, generally let's say 150 mil, and this is reinforced with an internal beam, uh, several internal beams, and edge beams, where we've got the timber frame and the brick veneer. So you see here there are the internal beams, then there are edge beams, all right? So the phases are this one. We assume that we arrive on site and the site is already level with control field. So we assume this is level. You also see that the services have already been installed by the plumber. So you see them there, here on the right, some services. Then what happens? We start to create the subgrade with this control field, and we make room for the internal beams and the edge beam <coughs> on the side. And then you see this, this is the type of loss formwork I was talking about. This will be placed here. And this is the most important phase. So we see that, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you this slide first because I think it's before. So be, before the guys arrive, uh, we also need to place a membrane. So this is the waterproofing layer that separates concrete from the ground. So at the same time, avoids the water uh, in, of the mix to, to go somewhere else, but at the same time it protects the mixture from external agents. Then there is the trench mesh, so it's here, the reinforcement, and they are kept in position by the bar chairs. You see somewhere there are rebates, services, and there is this formwork for the rebate at the corner. Now we go back, and we see that the, the pump trunk arrives. When it arrives early in the morning, everything has to be ready. There are generally, I don't know, six to ten people, generally eight, uh, eight men working on that. If the side is not ready, the trunk will go back, because otherwise the concrete will start hardening. So you can't wait. When, when you have to call it and book it, just when you're ready. All right? So when you're ready, you see here the pump trunk, and then there is the concrete pump here, eight men. So what they are doing is, I'm going to show you also this. You see the formwork is not going uh, all the way through because the rebate is going to be completed by hand. So in this way, we have access underneath, and we can also compact the concrete in a better way. But yes, they are, there is the pump operator and the other guys are actually spreading and leveling the concrete on the slab. So this is plastic, it's fresh. So you need to pull the concrete and fill in the space you, you, want, to, you want to cover. So really the next phase is then leveling by screeds. So there are these very uh, like uh, straight elements, timber or steel elements that are used just to level it to a nice and flat surface or by shower. And then you see that the rebate is actually uh, finished by hand, so with a hand trowel. 
and you see here there is a rebate for a shower and look at these pipes they're all capped on top why are they capped they are capped because you could accidentally pour concrete in that while you are pouring or because there could be debris or kind of things I remember that this was an, ex an exam question uh, four years ago and I laughed a lot when I read one of the answers one of the answers was that so that people cannot pee on them so that's not the answer <laughs> they're actually meant to do that so that, that is fine it's because of concrete that's the main issue so uh, surface level we will skip float uh, what happens here? Here you see the concrete bleeding, the exudation happens. So you see, it's wetting. The rebate, so now the concrete is setting. Again, leveling and finishing the surface. And the formwork is finally removed the day after, and the edge rebate is also ready and finished to take the brick veneer. And then what's the important phase? Clearing. So the pump pose, again, th there was concrete flowing in there, so we need to clean it before it gets, you know, a hard mass. And we use this sponge. And then now there is, I don't have pictures of how the curing was actually done, but that could be probably just supplying water every day and waiting for 28 days. But this is an important phase, and I, I don't have documentation on exactly what's done in this case. But yeah, that's it. So I'll meet you back in 10 minutes at 20 past 12. Try to be short and show you a few examples of concrete architecture. Any, any questions so far? Ready for the second part? Yes. So, um, I let you find out what these two architectures are. You definitely know the one on the right. You might not know the one on the left, but it's uh, very related to that. I can just tell you that the first one was done by Auguste Perret in France. So, one of the most important architects who applied uh, concrete to define this skeletons and frames which became the paradigm for Le Corbusier's work which arrives until Ville Savoie. So let's say it could be the beginning and the end. Uh, in Le Corbusier's architecture, this is one of the latest, it's, a, it's an unité d'habitation in Firmin Hiver in France. Uh, you see that I mean, somehow the idea is that this wall is the section of the house. So you say that there is, you probably know how the unit habitations are done. So there, are, there is always a double, <coughs> double story. So there is here double height. And then you can see through the window, this is the person. They're very, they're not very high. Then it's the ground floor and the entrance. So, and the corridor over there. So you, you see the section of the unit habitation is actually replicated on the wall. But somehow what's interesting for me is that this is also a way to uh, make a different pattern and texture on, on the concrete wall. So you see the planks have been used horizontally. In other cases, they've been used vertically. In other cases, there are rebates for these kind of sculptural drawings. Another example. Another bigger example, in this case, the formworks are, you see, bigger, so they are more engineered. But what about Louis Kahn? So Louis Kahn, I think, is really the first architect who uh, started this idea that concrete, exposite concrete, has to be designed and the formworks become an integral part of it. So what he did, especially when he designed the Salk Institute in La Jolla, he decided to have a small part of his office there, so they were spending all day designing formworks in order to be in the right shape and proportion. 
So you see what happens here. You have, you've got four big circles in this uh, Exeter library. This is uh, close to Boston, a bit up to Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, <clears throat> so what you see on the surface is generally um, the holes left by the ties. So when you need to tie together the two sides of the framework. So you see that also every, about every three meters, so every floor, you need to interrupt the concrete and then start over. So second cast, third cast. And what CAD did in that occasion, you will never be able to start and make sure that there is a flash connection. So you will always see a line in that point. You will always see a joint. So um, Khan decided that the best way to do that is actually to emphasize it, like you would do when you clean the mortar um, in the iron way. So it's, it's emphasized. Every time you stop the pouring and start over, then you emphasize it. You see here, this is a connection between three different elements. So there is one element that relates to the floor, the other element relates to the wall, and you understand that because you see here the, the hole left by the tie. Uh, look at this bottom part. Compaction didn't work so well in this phase, so you see that there are some aggregates. Uh, this is a kind of principle of segregation, so that the aggregates are separate from the mixture. And then also timber works very well as a third material together with that. Here you see another example of when you need to start a new uh, casting phase. And you see again, uh, generally the problem, as we said before, are, are the corners, so that you arrive with one formwork. So you would see the side of the formwork printed on the surface, and then you have the other one arriving on the other side. So what you do in that way? Khan is solving that issue in a smart way. You don't do the corner, so you turn it by 45 degrees and you resolve a technical issue. So that's, uh, at least I'm not sure exactly if that, uh, that was the problem, but uh, that's my guess. Uh, look here, even when you just uh, the look at the ceilings, you see that actually the, the lines left by the formworks, everything is printed on the final product. So it's important you design all of them. And look at this. They're actually centered with the, with the design of the timber parapet. So everything is designed maniacally in this building. Look at this example. In this example, there, there were definitely corners, and they were sold uh, better. So you see that there is almost the idea that you, you don't see the four marks at all that was done much better. Again, other connections with uh, masonry and timber. And this is another very interesting project in which we can see a few more aspects of what can be. Uh, what we see here again is that we have a first cast and then we start over. But actually, you see that the, you, you are not ever, you're not always able to control the mixture you get. So probably something went wrong, what was different in the, the aggregates or the sand was of a different color. So look at this. These two elements at the bottom are darker. Then there is one this is whiter and then again darker. So somehow you can understand straight away that they were realized in, in different steps. And Khan wanted to give the impression that they were actually realized in sets of three. So here we see the, the bold mark. But looking at the color of the aggregates, I can understand straight away that that was not the case. It was actually the first two, and then again these two. And I see that also on the back wall. So again, look at what happens. Here you see the corner of the formwork, and then all the other lines are done in order to fit with the design of the lifts and all of the other elements. Even if of the ground uh, or the floor tiles. In this case, you see that uh, all the services are uh, visible, so they're not covered by a ceiling. 
So also all the ceiling lines left by the formworks are designed to emphasize the direction and position of services and other elements and lights. Um, there is one thing that you need to take in account when you design everything in exposite concrete. All the rebates you think about, they have to be placed before puring because after that, there is only one way, which is drilling. Drilling means destroy your architecture. So bear in mind that you need to make sure that you have some room for that. It's already, everything is already thought before starting the construction site. Durability is not as a matter of material, it's also a matter of the building. If the building is not functional, as in the case of our building of architecture, it's likely to be less durable in time because you may want to you know, change it. You may want to demolish it if you have to change uh, the type of things you're going inside. So durability is also a matter of how you design things, not only the intrinsic property of the material. Other details, again, of how this seal is placed together with this uh, concrete element. Here again, you see that this was clearly done in two different uh, steps, but again, the way it was thought, it was that I could actually see a line aligned with the timber elements of the parapet. The Salki Institute is really the masterpiece that defines that. But also in that case, generally these photos are not published, but you see that there are some imperfections. So this is something you can't really control. So if you want, uh, if the aggregates are a bit darker, that's the type of concrete you get here on the right. And when they are lighter, you, you get a whiter mixture. So there are these type of imperfections. And I think it could be fascinating that, you know, you, you, you make sure that this type of things are just placed in the right order and position, but somehow it could be it could be fascinating. And you find it in several different parts of the building that you see there was a different mixed design. And probably it was not thought to be that way, but there was a, there was no alternative. You see that the formworks, actually the only elements you need in the formworks are these dots because they identify the position of the ties. So they are needed, otherwise you wouldn't even have enough strength to resist to the, com to the, to the, to the, let's say to the weight of the concrete pushing that. Let's say when you use self-compacting concrete that doesn't need vibration, it's almost water. So in that case you get hydrostatic pressure. So you need even stronger formworks. So the formworks have to be engineered to resist to that but the only element that you will see on the facade is actually this dot. All the other elements were explicitly designed by Louis Kahn to have this specific form. Look at some details. I'm going to show you maybe here. So you see that <coughs> there is a, these openings are actually an infill, but there is a bigger opening and you see the timber and, and concrete never touch. There is always a glass element in between. And look at these elements again. This is a joint we've seen before in lecture uh, two. Or, no, we saw this in lecture four last week about masonry. Look at all these elements. The idea is that you try always to combine elements, just placing them beside but not touching. Then the Church of Light. So this is Tadao Ando recently. Uh, the idea is that uh, he's really taking advantage of Louis Kahn's work, but he's making this concrete even more elegant, even, even more suitable to be exposed. So the overall idea is that this concrete is artificial mar marble. It's so elegant, it's marble, pure marble. So it's almost shining, all right? And you do that because you make sure that the formwork are, uh, the formworks are uh, cleaned and done in a specific way that you can get this result. Again, we see the same type of lines we saw before. So when there is this cross, that's the 
the position in which the architect decided that this line has to be and this was probably cast in two different paths so the bottom one and the top one so you see here again the, the one we saw before this is the generally the, the type of formwork you, you <coughs> used to do that so the black part the one with the label Perry this one is with this watermark it's uh, timber so that's actually timber and the metal part is only the frame right it's the, in that way you can actually get this very clean and shiny surface you see here the details so every time you need to start uh, to pour a new piece of concrete then you have this very bold element that identifies and makes it explicit on the facade you can also have this doubly curved facade uh, this is in Milan this is for the Giorgio Armani uh, factory uh, I think this is the showroom so where actually guests are invited to come there and see and uh, this is done with a very similar procedure. So Perry is allowed to, uh, they're able to make these doubly curved uh, formworks just by curving with a cold procedure these timber elements and keeping the same standard metal studs. So that type of thing can be realized in this way rather easily. And uh, I, I can show you some photographs on another construction site. This is again for that project, the Red Kilometer. Well, in this case, this concrete is going to be covered by some shading devices. So this is not entirely meant to be seen. So that the level of attention they, they put on that is, let's say, a bit lower. And you see, because of that, a few things going on. So look at that. Here you see when they you know, start a new, uh, to pour a new layer of concrete, and you see what happens on the lower part of the wall. So if you don't place the form more correctly, so this is what you generally would get. After it's done, you won't be able to clean it up. So this can be, can be completed, unless you paint it. But you really don't want to paint it when there is a spotted concrete. So these are the type of defects you need to take in account. And the difference is between this. So when you do that, you have an element that completely divides the two uh, parts of the wall so that the second one is protected and you don't get this type of defects. In this case, the formos are actually placed flush and that's the problem. So if you want to make a very nice exposite wall at your own house next year, just bear this in mind if you don't want to get these type of problems. Uh, Carlo Scarpa in Italy. So we are, the, his most important project is probably uh, the Tomba Brion. What, what's, what's the important aspect of this? Is that he's not trying to show how concrete is nice and clean like marble. He's trying to show that concrete is aging. Concrete can age and can deteriorate and can change its surface according to weather conditions and just because of uh, the years passing. This is probably also part of the concept. So, you know, this is a tomb, so it's about people dying and going to another life. So the idea is that things change continually. So what happens here is that when we see those type of defects on the wall, this is considered as a value. So this building is better over a few years rather than just now. So this type of deterioration is part of the design. This is a more recent one and I wanted to show you this for a few things. First because there are some additives there is ferry to get this red color so this is a this is not painted it's the color of the concrete so this is Valerio Giatti, Switzerland uh, yeah, 2007 in Switzerland they are very well known to produce high quality exposite concrete they know very well how to work with that so you will find several architects doing that 
from Luigi Snozzi, Galfetti, Vacchini, Olgiati. They all know how to do that. Most of their projects are done in exposed concrete. Another thing is that you can actually make some patterns. So these type of things were included in the formworks, and that's the result. That's what you get on the facade. Uh, Peter Zumthor is pushing even further the concept of uh, casting concrete in several steps and also of the idea of the formwork. So what happens on the exterior side, you see all these lines and differences in color and mixture and aggregates. This was actually done in probably 20 to 23 different steps. So you pour concrete, you wait that it sets, it starts hardening, then the day after you go there and you pour a second layer. After 20 days, you've done the building. So this chapel was done in this way, so that you clearly see that they belong to different stages. And you, have, you get this wavy facade. On the inside, even more interesting. So the formwork was made of timber poles, which was, they were meant to be like a lost formwork, so they're just there. And what he did at the end, he just decided to burn them, so that, that that's the result. You have this kind of, you see this concrete facade with the uh, consequences of burning. So that the lost form of what was actually burned to get this specific result inside the chapel. This again can be part of design. It, it's really an extreme way of taking advantage of both casting and formal techniques. Richard Mayer in Rome. Um, this is supposed to be a white concrete and also uh, like self-cleaning. So you're not required to clean it because there is, a, there is an additive that makes sure that the contact angle on the surface always creates drops that can actually go down. So it doesn't need any cleaning because they were scared that with these sails they would actually become black in a couple of years. Uh, well, as far as I can say, uh, I've been there a few times, I'm not sure that this pattern for this self-cleaning concrete is actually working very well, but probably they're on the way to develop a good product. So what happens in this case, uh, this is not cast in situ, this is prefab. So there are some prefab panels, more or less they are square shaped, these sails, they belong to portions of spheres. So it's like the Sydney Opera House somehow, let's say the poor version of the Sydney Opera House, where you see that they're all identical so that they can be repeated and precast pre and then just placed on the, on the side. But the, the, the real innovation of this project was about the white self-cleaning concrete so that one gets uh, dirt and black after a few years. Precast has also been used in uh, very different ways. It doesn't mean that you need to take a panel that is like rectangular shape and that's it. If you look at this mosque by Paolo Portuguese in Rome, this is a very interesting example of how repetition of precast elements can generate a rather interesting space. I find it an excellent project and you look at the plan view there is a clear repetition of patterns so that the element can be precast. But at the same time, the, the, the concrete is performing not as a heavy material, but as a very lightweight material. That, that's rather interesting. The concrete is the opposite of heaviness. Yeah, I'm mainly trying to show you an example you won't find much around here, Australia. Uh, but this one is so famous that you'll probably know it even here. So this is the sport hall in Rome by Pierluigi Nervi. It was done for the Olympic Games of the 1960. So what happened is that they were very late. So uh, it was uh, one year before the Olympic Games should start and there was nothing on the site, really nothing yet. So what Pierluigi Nervi did he defined a system, again, of like that was in between, between construction on site and prefabrication. 
to make sure that he could repeat a set of operations so fast to improve the construction process and make it faster. So what happens here, we have got a form resistance structure. So this is a concrete shell. It's very thin, again, because of the shape and all the stresses which are running in axial directions, just along the surface. But the most important thing is the definition of these, the so-called tabelloni, like big planks, so that they, they become the formworks. It's like you take a slice, a portion of that roof, you have those negatives, you pour concrete, and you define the roof in slices, and you just go around the circle, and they build these in a few months. In eight months, the sport hall was done. Eight months, imagine, from design to construction. So you see here that they're actually placing these negatives, which are cast as well. So they cast these, then they place them there, and then they cast the roof. So it was done in three different steps of negative, positive, negative, positive. Another picture, and again, you see the geometry. In those years, the idea was always to refer to analytical surfaces. So again, this is a portion of a sphere. So if I draw this in Rhino, I get this type of geometry. It, it would be very difficult to manage that without a geometrical reference. Trust me. Um, Niemeyer, this is the Mondadori headquarters. Mondadori is a publisher like Rutledge or Springer. And uh, these are the headquarters uh, close to Milan. And they were done by Oscar Niemeyer. What's interesting about this project is that you know, it looks like a set of columns and a roof, and then there is the headquarters, the offices are actually suspended inside. But what happens is that these are ruled surfaces. So these are portions of hyperbolic paraboloids, like saddles. I think that you see that in the next slide, uh, so far everything is fine, straight columns, not a problem, traditional formworks, and they, they reach this height. Then there is a little bit of scaffolding, to, to make the roof. So you see how much labor you need to put into that. But the interesting part is here. Here you go. So you see here the ruled surface. So this is actually a portion of an hyperbolic paraboloid. They can be described using straight lines. So if you just take a timber plank and you move it and rotate it, you can make that geometry. So that's what happens. You see this geometry here. Trust me, just you take this plank horizontally coming from the column and then you just rotate <coughs> it and you go up to the roof. This is an excellent design, an excellent way to use a limit of the formwork which is using straight elements to define an architecture in terms of shape and final materiality of the wall. All right, the same happens. Uh, these are other details of how the offices are actually suspended to the columns. Uh, other views. You see, from the outside, you don't even notice these horizontal lines. But, yes, uh, we completely forgot about that. So this is the probably the thing I'm most interested in, the idea of concrete as a lightweight material. This is Heinz Isler, uh, 1965, something, uh, 1960. Switzerland. This is on the Bern Zurich Highway. Uh, it's a service station. And uh, if we look at the thickness of things, we are about 30 centimeters here and 8 centimeters on the apex. So 8, like that. You, you can't even pour it almost. It's at the limit of possibilities. Uh, why? Because this shape is so perfect that it's actually obtained just hanging a piece of fabric. You know, it's just you take your coat and you hang it and you get a specific shape. And this shape, what it does, it cannot, it doesn't have any rotational stiffness, so it tends to get a shape that can resist only to tension forces. If you invert, if you mirror that shape, you get this. So this is a compression only situation. This compression only situation can be realized with concrete, out of concrete but with a very limited amount of material. So that's the idea, that you use concrete in the most efficient way. You can also do it with masonry, not a problem. 
and it, it has also been used uh, for bridges. I don't want to spend too much time now because I would like to do that uh, next week, when we, um, in a few weeks when we talk about grid shells. This is made out of soap bubbles, but the idea is that the shape of soap bubbles is very good to understand how the forces are running through a surface, and they replicated that using this uh, bridge. <coughs> Analytical surfaces again. So here, look at the bottom here. This is an hyperbolic paraboloid, a saddle. We trim it off, and then a polar array out of it, and we get this building. Again, very thin, so we use concrete in a very efficient way. Just let me go through this fast because we are almost at 1 p.m. Very complicated uh, roof uh, uh, and shape of a, of a church in Italy, Bergamo 1959 to 1961, architect Pino Pizzigoni. Uh, they are all hyperbolic paraboloids combined together within a frame. The shape is very complicated, I will explain you that in lecture nine. And that's what you see from the east side. So you see these are hyperbolic paraboloids. So again, concrete used in a very lightweight way. This project is even more interesting, Expo 1998 in Lisbon, Alvaro Silza. Why? Because the concrete does nothing. In this case, concrete is dead load. So this is a tensile structure, a set of cables running from one side to the other. And then the concrete is a dead load that helps the building to get that shape. So there are precast elements which are actually placed here. The thickness is 200 mil, like that. This one is completely free form, again, lightweight, but uh, yeah, it has to be optimized in order to design it this way. Something very recent that I, I'm gonna explain again in lecture nine. I just wanted to touch upon this because it still relates to concrete. Uh, there is an issue generally in these projects that when you have these doubly curved surfaces, you, you have a bit of problems in uh, making the connections. So generally when you want to place windows, openings, or this type of things, you get this type of you know, dirty details, not, not so nice, but we'll speak about that in the future. Concrete is also very good material when we want to talk about renovations. So in this case we're talking about a custom in Switzerland. Aurelio Galfetti is the architect, and you see the castle is over there, and in order to reach the castle, they excavated and made a lift, the castle. you enter from here, you get the lift, and you go up to there. So what happened is that they opened uh, like a, a big hole, they dig into the wall, into stone, and the way to create this opening was done using concrete. Like stone and concrete, again, like you remember the Roman theater I showed you last week. What they do is that they, they, they have this feeling that they're almost the same thing, that concrete has been there forever. They're, they're the same thing. Then you go up and again stone and concrete together. That works perfectly. Giving this idea of, of it's a timeless material. And then the last one is the Nordic Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. Uh, a set of beams running in both directions. One direction and then orthogonal one, thin and thick beams. A very large span to cover, and what's the idea is that, you know, the largest, the thicker, that's the rule. There is nothing else you can do. So they're spanning more than 20 meters, so these beams are higher than a meter each, and they're also shading devices. But again, this is the tension and contrast between heavy and light. And another picture of that. And I'll see you next week and talk about timber. Okay.